Believe me when I tell you, I owe Raining a lot. I have a debt to Raining that I cannot repay. So Michelle and I are going to do whatever we can to support this sport, promote this sport, and make this sport the most watched sport on television in the world. I will not rest until I accomplish that goal. What I love most about the horses is their honesty. They're gentle and very loving. I love riding. It's exciting, it's fun. I knew they were genuine the day I met them when I saw them, how much they loved their children, how much they loved their animals. And, and I mean, they really love their animals. And, and I really love my animals. And I mean, that shows a lot in people. It's, it's family, they're, they're my family. Hi, I'm Michael Maiola. Hi, I'm Michelle Maiola. And this is Silver Spurs Equine. Welcome. My family took their pilgrimage out west from New York. When we hit Denver, Colorado, I just fell in love with the west and I knew that someday, somehow, we were going to live out west. I wasn't born to live in the Bronx. It was 1981 and uh, I needed a secretary, uh, so we started to interview for secretaries. I then had to go on a business trip, which took me away for a couple of days. The office only had two or three people. The company was in its infancy. So my office manager at the time interviewed Michelle while I was away in California. Uh, when I came back, she said, uh, we hired uh, your secretary for you. And I said, great. And then I went into the office, and there she was. And I tell you, the second that I saw her from that very, very moment. I was struck by a thunderbolt and uh, that thunderbolt has not <laughs> subsided to this day, 29 years later. I didn't really think about horses as a child. Um, it was when I met Michael and we went to the dude ranches in up, upstate New York and uh, it developed for both of us at the same time. We would take weekend trips to dude ranches in the Catskill Mountains in New York. Uh, and we would ride trail horses there. Well, invariably, uh, we would always come home with sore bottoms. And we got tired of that. So we decided uh, to go to this stable that we passed on the road going into Manhattan every day and take riding lessons. And it was there that we started taking lessons. We were trained in English dressage. Michelle became a hunter jumper. I always try to uh, dress my horse up or tack my horse up with Western gear uh, when they absolutely forbid it at this particular stable. Uh, so I was always the outcast and I was just, just take my horse and ride on trail while Michelle was doing all the fancy dressage and jumping work. When I first came to Scottsdale with Michael, uh, it was on a vacation. We went to see the Grand Canyon and made a stop here in Scottsdale. He looked at me, Michael, and said, how would you like to retire here someday? And I said, sure, why not? Okay. Um, and then 9-11 happened, so it was a lot sooner than I thought. 9-11 
was a very devastating time for us. September 11th was on a Tuesday. That Sunday, my family and I were at Windows on the World having brunch. We went to the Trade Center all the time. It was our favorite building in Manhattan. On Monday, I had a business meeting in Boston, which is where the planes took off from. Uh, it was late Monday evening, and I called Michelle, and I said, uh, "Hun, I could either stay in town because it's getting kind of late, or I, if I rush, I can make the last shuttle back to New York. And she said the kids were acting up and to get myself home, which I did. If I didn't, I would have been on the seven o'clock shuttle the following morning and been in the air when the first planes hit the World Trade Center. So that's how our lives were intertwined with the World Trade Center. Shortly after 9-11, there was a holiday and we spent it on, in Bayville. When we went there, the entire bay was filled with PT boats, destroyers, there were fighter planes flying overhead. And when we saw this, we knew we had to get out of Dodge. So the following February, we came to Arizona and we bought the land that would eventually be where our house stands today. So Michelle had uh, a friend that showed her this stable not far from here that had horses and uh, suggested, why don't we just go to take a look? So we did. Um, and when we did, Michelle found this beautiful horse, an Arabian by the name of Dust Devil, that we purchased immediately, and then Michelle purchased another horse shortly thereafter. My goal with Dust Devil was to learn to become a rainer. And the people at the stable said that Dust Devil could do raining. So I said, great. And they started to teach me uh, raining. Well, after a couple of weeks, there wasn't very much that they could do with me because I did have many years experience riding a horse. I just needed to learn the reining maneuvers. And their instructors were not very knowledgeable in reining. Uh, so they saw my frustration and they told me that there is a fellow that had just started a couple of two-year-olds off uh, and he's done a little bit of reining in his life. Uh, maybe uh, he could teach you some things. So I said, terrific, uh, introduce me to him. And they introduced me to Brett Stone. I'm Brett Stone and I am the training manager of Silver Spurs Equine. It was 2004, I'd ventured to North Carolina, and I was going to head down to Florida to show horses uh, for the first time. I hadn't shown in about seven years, and, and my folks were, one of them got sick at home, and, you know, I got to this church service, and the pastor said, you know, this talked about, you know, conquering your fears and taking care of what you need to take care of, and I sat there and I listened to him, and I thought, you know what, you need to go home and take care of what you need to take care of. So I did. So I gave that up, and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to be able to show horses. So I kind of put an end to that, I'm not showing anymore. And I came back here and I decided to, uh, oh, I missed riding when I got back here about four months. I thought I'm gonna ride some two-year-olds out of an Arabian farm. And so I go out there and, and when I'm out there, I, I, uh, I meet this man named Michael Myola, okay? And uh, they asked me, will you, will you give this guy a lesson on his Arabian? So I, you know, I, I meet Michael for the first time. I did not know Brett at all. I did, certainly did not know he was a futurity champion. Um, so we started training together. We were doing quite well. We made Dust Devil do things uh, an, an Arab uh, just can't do normally. But Brett, uh, with his expert uh, training technique, was able to make Dust Devil turn and sliding stops, everything, to the best that an Arab could do it. You know, with helping Michael with, with his horse Dust Devil for six months and working our butts off on it, he loved it. I was loving helping him. It was just that we were having a blast. And my two-year-olds that I was riding were, going, were getting farther along, and, and Michael took me up to his house, and uh, the house wasn't finished, and we were sitting on the doorstep of the house, I remember, and, and, he, and he said to me, he said, uh, you want to do this all over again? And I said, yeah, I, I'd love to. 
And he looked at me and he knew I meant it. And he goes, well, so do I. I, I want to, I want to do, I've never done this before, but I want to do this. This is what I really want to do. So let's do it. And I said, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I said something about being lucky. And he said, no, there's no such thing as luck. Uh, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. So now we're training. And all of the people at the stable, when Brett and I were training, would stop what they're doing to watch Brett and I train. And they would tell their instructors, uh, we don't want to do what we're doing, we want to do that. The first time I saw a horse was my sister had one uh, that she got when I was probably about eight or nine years old and they kept it in the backyard and she would ride it and go to some competitions and I'd get drug along to the competitions and what really got me into horses to want to uh, start getting involved in riding myself was when uh, I watched Secretariat win the Triple Crown. And because I was a huge sports fan and always read Sports Illustrated magazine, and he became Athlete of the Year that year, 1973. Just watching him through the whole thing and falling in love with that horse as, as almost like a person, uh, I was like, man, I think I want to do this. I didn't know in what way, but I wanted to do this. Boomerang and I got together in 1991. And uh, a friend of mine named Doug Carpenter had purchased Boomernick and Greg Ward's sale. And uh, he had told me, and Bobby Avila told me, that, that they had this two-year-old that was by uh, Remenick and, and how he was bred. And boy, he was, he was the real deal. And uh, I said, well, why don't you send me a video? Well, they sent me a video, and I, said, I called him back, and I said, you know what, guys? I think he's the real deal. I would compete with Boomerneck and win the 1992 NRHA Futurity on him. And, uh, and then 1993 I competed with him and showed him in all kinds of open classes and at the Sun Country Circuit and the World Championship Photo Show and I think I showed him 24 times that year, which is unheard of today. I don't know if anybody going to the arena 24 times. And I went 24 times without ever taking him in a fool him and school him class, without ever uh, reprimanding him in a class one time or what we would call schooling today and I just went in and showed. And people every time I would go in they all expected the same result. So it was kind of hard because when you would go they would be standing there waiting to get that same electricity that they got before. So at the end of the year when it was finally over I was like man I don't want to do that again. It was, you know people would laugh because they'd say you know what are you going to do when, when, after this year? i say I'm done. I'm not showing them anymore after this year. And uh, it was kind of one of those things where I said, you know what, I'm not going to ride him anymore. We had our great time together, and, and I love Boomernick as, as an individual, and I say that almost like as a person, but, but I got to know him that well. And uh, there wasn't anything he didn't know about me, and I didn't know about him. And he would leave me and go on his breeding uh, travels, I guess, because he went to, I don't know how many different breeding farms, maybe eight or nine. And uh, through the time period, uh, there were started off with Claudia owning him, and then uh, four people owned him after that, and then a, a group of people owned him. And then eventually my folks would buy him. And then through those travels, because they sent him out of the breeding farms, uh, Boomerick and I would never get, be united again. It was hard for me to go see him because I loved him so much that uh, um, you know, I could almost cry about it today, actually, because I loved him so much, it was hard to go to those farms and see him, knowing I had to leave him. And so it was easier not to go. Uh, so uh, my life took me down different roads during that time anyway. So. You know, when it would all come together here and, uh, and, and we would have the chance at Silver Spurs that Michael says, you know, let's go buy Boomernick. Let's start this all over again. You know, when he came off the trailer here, I'll, I'll never forget it. Probably the best thing about it is that I get to go out and, and uh, uh, I get to go feed him carrots. He's only 200 feet from my doorstep. 
and he has been that way since he got here and so I get to feed him carrots every night everybody goes oh you don't feed him carrots oh I feed him bags of carrots every night and I feed him bags of carrots and the other a lot of the, all the horses on the ranch but him and, and I get to feed him carrots every morning and I get to wake up the morning with him and go to bed at night with him so uh, you know that meant, means a lot to me. One of the um, stories that I could tell you about Boomin, my, my absolute favorite would be the day that you had Michelle uh, turn Boomernick for the first time. Uh, when we first got Boomernick in 2006, we used to ride him an awful lot. And Michelle, uh, as she became his handler, became the only one that Boomernick would let ride him. And uh, so Brett said to Michelle one day, did you ever turn him? And she said, no. Uh, so Brett asked her if she would like Boomernick to turn for her. And she said, okay, how do we do it? So Brett started to give her the instructions. So she said, like this, <laughs> and boom, Boomernick went into a turn, the likes of which he had never done before. You have to understand that Boomernick is turning for the love of his life. So he is going to turn like he never turned before. And uh, Michelle instantly, from the centrifugal force, started to come out of the saddle and she started to scream. Uh, and as soon as Michelle started to scream, Boomernick instantly stopped. And he put his head down. Um, and Michelle got off him. And he was moping and moping. He wouldn't pick his head up for anything because he thought he had hurt Michelle. And so Michelle had to soothe him and soothe him but eventually, the only way Boomernick would be happy is if Michelle got back on Boomernick and let Boomernick turn for Michelle. So she held on for dear life, and Boomernick turned for her. Uh, and the look on Boomernick's face uh, when he knew he had uh, upset the love of his life is, is just a look I'll never forget. also acquired uh, stallions of all of the other, uh, that are cults of all of the other million dollar sires. So we have the complete bloodline of all of the reigning royalty at Silver Spurs and we'll be working with those studs, with our brood mares, as we experiment and breed to come up with that perfect reigning horse. We have a, another stud that we bought in 2008 named Conquistador Wiz. Now this little guy has won just about every award there is to win. He's already sired a Futurity Champion. He's already sired a non-pro Futurity Champion. He sired the horse that became the highest money earning horse in NRHA history that took uh, the crown away from Commander's neck. The, uh other sire that, that, that we have at the ranch is um, Finest China Rose, who kind of completes the whole picture because he's by um, a son of Hollywood Dunn, a, re a really, really good horse named uh, Footwork's Finest. Yeah. And out of a great mare named Finest China Rose, who uh, I think was intermediate champion in, at the reigning fraternity in the year she showed. And, and so with him, it brings the, the Hollywood Dunn into the mix too. Our newest addition to the Silver Spurs family of stallions is the ever popular Spooks Got a Gun. Uh, we bought Spooks in May of 2010. We primarily bought Spooks because of his uh, breeding, uh, being sired by the uh, fantastic Ray Starlight and being out of uh, Katie Gunn was a uh, a pedigree that we needed at Silver Spurs to round out our uh, stallion offerings. 
How, but we had no idea how popular Spooks was with the public. We bought them uh, as, as a competition horse. We didn't even factor in uh, the value of Spooks as a, uh, a breeding sire. And when he came to the ranch and the phones just kept ringing off the hook to get breedings to Spooks, uh, we were absolutely amazed. When we first got Spooks Got a Gun, the very day we got him and loaded him off the trailer, I rode him, and then Michael rode him, and then Michelle rode him, and then we took him to the breeding barn and collected him, and then I took him over to the show barn and put him, surrounded him by show horses, and he never missed a beat. And I sat there when he was, when Michelle was riding him and Michael were riding him, I was like, you know, he loves this. He seems to have his own little uh, following, his, his little fan uh, fan club, I guess. Yeah, he came we can with. call it a fan club. And uh, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with his personality and his color. Yeah. I mean, his color is just you know, I mean, it, it's, it's like a uh, Picasso painting, I suppose, or something like that. And then you know, but his personality, the way he is around people, and the way always he's, smiling, always playing with his lips, talking to people, and doing stuff and he, 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 they just go to him, they just flock to him. One of the most uh, gratifying stories that I can tell you with regard to our breeding program and reigning is this letter that I received from a Canadian student not long ago. She had saved a couple of years ago, she saved up every penny she could to buy a breeding to our stallion Conquistador Wiz. She bought the breeding, had a magnificent foal, and as a two-year-old she was able to sell this foal for $60,000. That was a life-changing event for her. She was able to complete her education with the money that she made from the breeding to my stallion. And when Michelle and I read that letter, it was extremely gratifying for us. And those are the types of stories that we want to tell about our experience in reigning. Not how we won this and our stallion did this, but how we changed the lives of ordinary people that put all of their life savings into breeding a particular horse, and that's what happens. That is what we're in reigning for. As it relates to the horses, Silver Spurs was started out of Michelle's, mine, and Brett's love of horses. I think they're the most magnificent creatures on earth. God must have been in a really good mood the day he created horses.